Hello everybody, and today we're going to talk about the Quagga Project, which saw a far-fetched idea in the 80s into reality today. For those of you totally unaware of what the Quagga is, it was an extinct species of zebra that went extinct at the hands of man in the late 1800s, and the Quagga Project was set up in 1987 by a group of dedicated people to help right this wrong. The overall aim of the Quagga Project is to breed back the quagga phenotype into plain zebras today. Through selective breeding, the plan is, very basically, to breed plain zebras which have characteristics resembling of the original quagga and breeding them together to give a population of plain zebras which at least look like quaggas. The people who hunted the quaggas had a lot of uses for them. They made grain bags out of their hides, they made leather out of their hides, but the quagga meat itself was also fed to farm labourers who looked after the said livestock which the quagga were competitors for. And because of this, the last quagga was lost on the 12th of August 1883 when the last individual died in Amsterdam Zoo. Now it wasn't known at the time that this was in fact the last quagga as kind of back then it was a little tricky as all zebras were actually referred to as quagga coming from the indigenous term for a zebra as quagga. Essentially, all zebras, whether they were a zebra or a quagga, mountain zebras, plain zebras, they were just all called quaggas. Interestingly though, there is some anecdotal evidence saying that this quagga who died in 1883 wasn't actually the last quagga to have died, but the last one was rumored to have died in the 1930s. Originally thought to be a standalone species of zebra, the quagga were thought to be lost the ages. The German taxidermist Reinhold Rau had this hunch that they were more of a subspecies through examination of the preserved skins in various museums around the world. It was from these skins that Reinhold Rau was able to extract some muscle tissue from a preserved skin and send it away for DNA analysis. And this analysis came back and showed that the quagga were actually a subspecies of zebra. And this of course meant that the quagga had the potential to be selectively bred again into a subspecies. And that is what Reinhold Rau set out when he started the Quagga Project in 1987. And it is here from the creation of the Quagga Project that Jurassic Park author Michael Creighton gained some inspiration to write his book Jurassic Park, which of course was published in 1990 and went on to be one of the most successful franchises in film history. So now the seed has been planted and the Quagga Project is starting up and running and they're trying to pick individuals for the breeding. Individuals who may have slightly browner skin than most zebras, they may have less stripes and particularly with Quagga what you want is no stripes at all towards the back and the belly. In order to come up with how progress is being marked through the generations of selective breeding, they have to come up with a, a classification guide. Zebras have been split up into five segments, and stripes are then counted accordingly to the criteria. On segments one to three, you only count full unbroken stripes, which extend over halfway over the body. Do not count shadow stripes. On segments four and five, count any stripe that's below the body line. So when does a modern day zebra be classified as a quagga? Well, when there's no scoreable stripes on the hind, and there's no stripes on its legs, then it is classified according to the Quagga project, as a quagga. Of course, this just means that the zebras look like a quagga and is known as a row quagga. And so far, six out of a hundred individuals are classified as a row quagga after five generations. The most famous row quagga to date, of course, is Nina and her foal. And they have quite similar characteristics to the original quagga, with the lack of stripes, I guess, being the main one as per the classification model. But there are some people out in the community who believe that even calling them Rau Quagga is sort of a sin in the fact that they're not Quaggas. In fact, they believe that they should be called Rau Zebras because they are selectively bred zebras, not selectively bred Quaggas. And the Quagga, of course, are extinct, so they can't be brought back. And Rau Quaggas are just a phenotype of plain zebras which so happen to resemble the original quagga. So what are the main differences between a quagga and a row quagga? 
Well, the new row quaggas vary, I guess, between broad, solid black lines on their neck to narrow, solid, maybe even broken lines on their neck. Whereas this just was not the case for the original quagga. And again, you can put that down to selective breeding and not enough generations have gone by to generate these broad lines. So number two then are the stripes on their face. Again, the row quagga tends to vary between solid black lines and narrow black lines, whereas the original quagga just didn't. And the row quagga tends to have a large narrow white strip in the middle of the face, which they just didn't have on the original quaggas. Finally, the row quagga just simply isn't as brown as the original quagga. And this is something the quagga project have addressed and they are going to seek out individuals of zebra which have more of a brown hue to them and integrate them into the population for breeding. Another difference which hasn't been 100% confirmed yet is that the row quagga's manes tend to be a lot longer than the original quagga's but like I said this hasn't been addressed or really highlighted all that much, it was just something I read. Something interesting I came across online as well when reading up on the brown hue of the original quagga and the quagga project is that someone mentioned that they believe the Quagga Project were using the wrong species of zebra altogether in that they should be using the mountain zebra and not the plain zebra. And I think the basis of this was mainly because the mountain zebra has a similar range with the original Quagga, which is fair enough, and the mountain zebra is also a bit more brown in colour than the plain zebra, which I guess is a fair point. But then again, the DNA samples from the original quagga were traced back to the plain zebra and not the mountain zebra. So I'm not really sure how much that qualifies other than the fact that they have a similar hue and a similar range, which I guess. So with all this in mind, it's fair to say that the quagga project isn't without its criticisms. And that some people even go as far as to say that it's a stunt and it's just a way for funding money into something else. But, and the reasons for this, of course, are because the original, or this new quagga doesn't bring up the new ecological adaptations or doesn't fulfill an ecological niche outside of a plain zebra, which, yeah, I guess is true. As previously mentioned, the quagga project currently has six row quagga individuals, and the plan is, once this number reaches 50, these individuals will be released into a reserve to breed and do their own thing and not be under a project. And 50, of course, is the number, is the minimum number you need for a population to avoid inbreeding on its own under the founder effect. Despite the criticisms, I actually really like the Quagga project. I really like what they've tried to do and to be honest, what they have successfully done over the past 40 years in righting a wrong and bringing back a subspecies from the dead. And of course, it's worth saying that the Quagga project aren't the only back breeding project in the sense that you breed other subspecies or species together to bring back a species that has gone extinct. This of course is different from the extinction and speciation, speciation and all that but there has been other projects such as um, the Dory Wolf project which I think is really cool and also the what was it the Iron Age pig which is a boar and a pig hybrid they're trying to breed them together both of those coincidentally actually started in the 80s as well. Um, so I think there was a big boom around the 80s for bringing back extinct animals. And this is probably why Jurassic Park came along so close after that. The other examples of back breeding are probably the Auroch and the European Wild Horse programs, which kind of started in the 1920s, where pretty much these rich people were like, yeah, these are pretty cool. Wouldn't it be great if we brought them back? And I can't really find too much about the Wild European Horse Project other than that, I guess they kind of lost interest as you know cars became more popular and that horses were now used for racing more than anything else. But the Europe Project has actually turned into the Taurus Project, which seemed to have gotten some progress in 2009, where they were breeding hardy cow, hardy and feral cows, cattle, and they were going to breed these with the Scottish Highland cows to try and breed back, or back breed as it were, the aurochs. 
But however, that website I was looking at seems to be deactivated as of 2013. At least it said it was going to be updated in 2013 and that's 10 years later, almost 10 years later. And so I don't think there's too much going on there, but I didn't do too much digging into that. Like I said, overall, I really actually like the Quagga project and I like back breeding, I guess, as a concept. I think it's really cool in that it's possible to bring back a species which is extinct through sim something simple as selective breeding. But today with the technology we have, it's probably a lot more, I guess, conceivable to see something along the lines of Jurassic Park, where something which has been extinct for quite a while, we have some genome of it and we can fill in the DNA with something else. Do I think it's a good idea? No. Is it worth it? Probably for some species, but you have to look at the adaptations and what ecological niche it would fit in. And I guess probably to avoid what happened in Jurassic World when everything, when all the animals just became released. And I actually think that Jurassic World Dominion, hey look, I actually got the name right that time. I think they actually did quite well, good job of showing how these dinosaurs wouldn't just fit in. They wouldn't just exist with the existing population. Like, you know, you have so many different animals fulfilling the same niche that it's, there's no real need, so one's gonna go. And I think they did a good job of that in the film. And I think that's kind of what we're going to see with back breeding and selective breeding going forward in terms of animals at least, in that we need to see what niches they're going to fill. So if you have reached this far in the video, I'd like to thank you for watching. Um, this was just really a fun video to make. I've been working on it, on and off for about six months and I know look the quality probably doesn't show that I was on and off for six months but I just really wanted to make this video and because I wanted to make this video it stopped me making other videos but we did make the selective breeding video and the Jurassic World video because I felt they needed to be made or they were a good build up to this video but anyway um, that's it for me for today so thank you again for watching Please like and subscribe if you liked it and uh, we'll catch you all next time.